Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my name is Seth Jones, uh, a vice president here. And welcome, more importantly, to a conversation with the AUKUS Army Chiefs on land power's contribution to AUKUS Pillar 2. AUKUS, which was first announced in September of 2021, is a trilateral US-UK-Australia defense partnership, uh, which includes two pillars, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. I'll let uh, Dr. Charles uh, Edel talk more about that. Uh, but last year, the Australian, British, and US Army chiefs signed a statement of intent identifying capabilities of priority for cooperation across the three countries. Uh, this effort is intended to contribute to the broader work under AUKUS Pillar 2. So in this panel discussion, um, which I'll hand off to, uh, to Charlie, uh, U.S. General Randy George, U.S. General, uh, U.K. General Sir Patrick Sanders, and Australian Lieutenant General Simon Stewart will discuss AUKUS Pillar 2 from a land domain perspective and how the three armies can work together to enhance collaborative efforts in capability developments. Uh, Charlie, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Seth. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us here today, all our distinguished guests that we have, and for those of you who are tuning in uh, online for this discussion uh, about AUKUS and how it intersects with land power. Uh, I'm thrilled to have the three AUKUS Army Chiefs from Australia, from the United Kingdom, and from the United States here with us today. When AUKUS came out, as Seth just described, in September of 2021, everyone immediately fastened on pillar one. That is the nuclear powered conventionally armed submarines. Uh, that was what AUKUS looked like. So naturally it had a maritime dimension and focus to it. But AUKUS of course is broader than that. And it's evolved over the past two plus years. In fact, it continues to evolve about both what it is and what it might become. And that really brings us to our conversation here today. Now, Seth had mentioned Pillar 2. Pillar 2 is an initiative to really hone, push, and forge collaboration uh, between the three nations in advanced technologies, whether we're talking about hypersonic missiles, quantum, artificial intelligence, unmanned uh, vehicles, or a range of other options. Uh, really, uh, that is what AUKUS is, but understanding that has been a bit of a challenge thus far. And to really discuss what opportunities Pillar 2 might bring, to discuss the emerging challenges uh, in the Indo-Pacific theater and how land power is situated to meet those challenges, and to really hone in on this particular configuration, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States and why it's so critical in this theater. I'm beyond honored uh, to have the three Army Chiefs here. Uh, Lieutenant General Simon Stewart has been the Australian uh, Chief of Army since July of 2020 to 2022, bringing 35 years of experience and command uh, at every level from the company to the Joint Task Force Brigade to the force level and having served in East Timor, Afghanistan, Egypt, and Israel. And most recently before this role, he served as the lead of land capabilities in Army headquarters. Next to him, I have General Sir Patrick Sanders, who has been the Chief of the British Army since June of 2022 and has over 38 years of service and command experience in Northern Ireland in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Iraq, and Afghanistan. Finally, uh, last but certainly not least, General Randy George, who assumed duties as the 41st Chief of, Ar Chief of Staff of the Army in September of 2023, prior to that serving as the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. He was commissioned as an infantry officer in 1988 uh, from West Point, and has previously served in Italy, in Iraq, and Afghanistan. Uh, we're going to hear some initial thoughts. I'll run the conversation for a little while, but very eager to make sure that we go out to the audience uh, for questions. That means both people who are online, uh, you can register questions directly through our portal, but also for those of you in the room too. Uh, let me turn to you first, uh, General Stewart. Uh, and I'm hoping that you can begin this conversation by telling us how the Australian Army 
is really thinking about the transformation that it needs to undergo to meet the new types of challenges that we're seeing in the Indo-Pacific region. Sure. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, if I might just begin by thanking CSIS for hosting this today and to Seth for the introduction to you, Charlie, and also to uh, my friends and counterparts and, and everybody that's turned out today. Um, just um, last year, uh, the Australian government commissioned a very detailed uh, review called the Defence Strategic Review and then issued um, very clear direction to the Department of Defence and, and the ADF. Um, and it's probably worth just taking a moment to, to sketch out the context. It, um, as would be familiar to my counterparts, recognised that in an era of great power competition, defence and security is once again a whole of nation endeavour, uh, but even more so, it requires us to work uh, even more closely and in a more integrated fashion with allies and with partners. Um, as military professionals, uh, our, our greatest challenge is balancing the enduring human nature of warfare with its ever-changing character, and that ever-changing character is absolutely um, dominated by technological uh, advancement at pace. And so really the, the challenge for us is how do we adapt at a speed that is relevant and, uh, and very clearly by working together uh, we can achieve the sort of tempo, the sort of speed and the sort of outcomes that we all uh, need. My job of course as the Chief of Army is to maximise the value proposition of land power and the contribution that armies and land power make to the combined multi-domain force or the integrated force um, as, we, as we describe it. And if I can just quickly you know, sketch out what that value proposition um, looks like. Five key elements, we could go into them in a bit more detail later, but presence, you know, land forces are present uh, among populations. They can understand the environment. Uh, they are persistent. They can consolidate gains across the integrated force. They can provide reassurance for partners and they can contribute to deterrence through their persistent effect. Asymmetry. In the Indo-Pacific region, the uh, A2AD complexes are optimised to defeat air and maritime forces. So how do we leverage the asymmetric effect of standing land forces that are uh, distributed, that are survivable, that are sustainable? And of course, um, the, uh, the, the ability to support our Navy and maritime forces in their manoeuvre by applying um, maritime um, fires from the land and, and expand the options there. Um, the fourth is versatility. You can take almost any army unit or formation and it can, can perform a very broad range of tasks, from humanitarian assistance and disaster relief through to combat operations. And fifthly, and I think particularly importantly uh, in today's uh, climate, we are really good value for money. You get a lot of bang for buck out of, uh, out of armies and out of uh, land forces. So a you know, relatively inexpensive uh, way of, of generating <coughs> that value proposition. Um, from an Australian army perspective, um, I'm part of an ADF that has been directed to, to move from being a joint force to an integrated force. Quite simply, that means a joint force converges in effect. An integrated force is, uh, is uh, something you do uh, to very deliberately and consciously design an integrated force so that it's more than the sum of its parts. Uh, we've been directed to move from a balanced to a focused force. Uh, and that means prioritising. And very clearly, AUKUS Pillar 1 is, is, an, is a great example of that prioritisation. And the Army, my, the Army I'm privileged to lead, has been directed to optimise for littoral manoeuvre operations. And if I may just finish on that, um, whenever you mention littoral, people will immediately think of ships, boats, watercraft. They are absolutely central and important and vital, but it's actually about manoeuvre 
and advantage for the multi-domain force. The littorals are a couple of hundred kilometres either side of the beach. The air above that space, the electromagnetic spectrum that operates within it, and the, and the space um, capabilities that can be applied within it. So it's how do you um, better leverage positional advantage for that integrated or combined multi-domain uh, force. And so our um, adaptation, our transformation is, is all about um, very quickly filling the gap between where we are today and our capabilities, where we need to, to be in the future, long range precision fires, uh, the, the ability to draw on a, um, a persistent sensor network, um, to decide at machine speed um, and to be able to manoeuvre in those littorals, but also to maintain the capability for the close fight, the combined arms fight, uh, which is often the decisive phase uh, in any battle and, and campaign. Thanks very much. Uh, one of the things that you had said, which I hope maybe we can uh, draw out a little bit more, is the shift, as you rightly noted, highlighted in the Defence Strategic Review about different uh, suite of challenges than we had previously so therefore a different type of force, uh, no longer balanced across to everything, but focused against a particular type of challenge. So hopefully we can pull that thread uh, a little bit more. But uh, things look uh, similar, uh, but not the same uh, in a different part of the world. Uh, General Sanders, I, I really, with the Army fully uh, invested in European security, quite obviously, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the British Army uh, evolving against the backdrop of what's happening in Europe, and then on top of that, because it is on top of that, what is the role for the British Army in the Indo-Pacific? Well, thanks, Charles. And it's, uh, I mean, as Simon said, it's a huge honor to be here sharing a platform with British Army's two closest partner armies and two close personal friends in Randy and Simon as well. Uh, and like many, I have spent much of my operational career serving alongside US and Australian soldiers. Um, it's also a signal honor to be here. Um, you're described as the finest defense and national security think tank in the world. That's quite a place to be sitting. Um, and this feels timely. You know, we, we can see threats prolifer proliferating at a scale, at a pace, and a vector that we probably haven't seen for 80 years or more. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that these threats begin to metastasize uh, together. Um, and it's timely in the sense that time is surely the most critical strategic resource that we have in the face of these threats. And so it is so important to begin to restore deterrence, and that's about magazine depth, it's about war fighting competitive edge, and it's about partners, and that is what is at the heart of AUKUS, and for us, AUKUS Pillar 2. So I thought I'd just talk a little bit about strategy, about Ukraine, about land power, and what we're doing about it. Um, on strategy, I, I always tend to go back to George Kennan. Um, I think that it's hugely resonant um, uh, with the Euro-Atlantic area at the moment, but, but more widely as well. And from that, we need to relearn the nuances of the strategies of containment, of deterrence and coercion. But it's also clear that we no longer have the luxury of treating means as something that's discretionary, because a lack of strategic means will ruthlessly undermine the ends that we're pursuing. And we need in that context just to remind ourselves that Russia is currently spending 40% of public expenditure on defense and security. So that draws us to Ukraine. And Ukraine, uh, and I'll say this unashamedly, Ukraine really matters. I mean, this is the greatest geostrategic catastrophe for the free world, arguably since World War II. It is the principal pressure point on a really fragile world order. And it is, about, it is about a few thousand hectares of fertile land in eastern Ukraine, but it's about much more than that too. This is a concerted attempt to defeat our system, our way of life politically, psychologically, and symbolically. And I think Ukraine is the test for our generation. And how we respond to that test is going to reverberate through history because Russian aggression cannot stand. Because if we fail, if you contemplate what failure looks like, we end up with a world that is that we bequeath to our children and our grandchildren that is infinitely more unstable, infinitely more perilous, where autocracies have been emboldened and our collective deterrence and security has been weakened. So for now, Ukrainian blood, and we should be clear about that, and bravery is buying time. But they need our support. And it's not just morally right, 
to do that. It is in our own self-interest because preserving our future security by supporting Ukraine is much better value than fighting a war. And then thirdly, just turning to land power. I mean, I'm an army chief, so I'm going to advocate for my domain, not in zero-sum terms, but it is an inescapable fact that land is where people live. It's where human affairs are settled. It took a great naval strategist, Julian Corbett, to remind us that except in the rarest of cases, uh, the great affairs of state are settled on land, and it's where wars are concluded. And I think, as Simon was saying, that it is growing in relative value as a domain, because as we see projectile ranges and precision increasing, the large capital platforms uh, in the other domains are at risk. And you can mitigate this by thinking cross-domain, because cross-domain effects are more deliverable ever. And as Simon said, land platforms are disposable, dispersable, survivable, and they're cheap. They're really good value. And they allow you to unlock challenges in much more constrained and contested maritime and air domains. And that's as applicable to the Euro-Atlantic area as it is to the Indo-Pacific. So what does all this mean for us? Well, I, uh, I'm frequently guided by Dr. Jack Watling. I'll give him a chuck up because I think he's becoming a national treasure. Works at IESI if you haven't been there. And he writes uh, that if the fundamental elements of the character of war are changing, as Simon was saying, then armies have to transform and not just optimize. And we are going through, as an army, the most profound transformation of my career. Um, it's guided, our North Star, if you like, is uh, an operating concept, a land operating concept that is the most significant, tested, and peer-reviewed of any concept that we've produced in more than a generation. But the context this describes is happening right now, and the principal deductions and recommendations that you draw from that have to be applied to the force right now. But the processes that we have for design, for acquisition, are based on an orderly, measured cascade of ideas and then very stately approvals processes. And we're operating in series rather than parallel. And we have to transform that. And it can be the only approach. And that transformation demands a leap of faith. It demands ruthless prioritization, a willingness to discard old, old structures and old ideas and a tolerance of risk, including financial risk, that feels counterintuitive when you are husbanding taxpayers' resource. What does all that mean for us? As you said, NATO is our North Star, but it is not exclusive in the way that you implied. Indeed, uh, the UK's largest and most persistent presence, to use two of the characteristics that Simon described in the Indo-Pacific, are land. We have a joint task force which operates alongside US, Australians, and other partners across the Indo-Pacific. And the Indo-Pacific, the free and open Indo-Pacific, is in the UK's strategic long-term interests. And pillar two of AUKUS allows us to develop high-end capabilities that will enhance deterrence, yes, in the Indo-Pacific, but it's applicable across all theatres. And the way we think about how we design that force is really guided by four values, height, breadth, depth, and edge. So height is about our convening power as a multi-domain integrator, as Simon was describing, and as a leader across NATO. So if you like, that's about growing core level capabilities. Yeah. Breadth is about uh, broadening our strategic utility and therefore offering greater choice, more options for government. And that's generally growing capabilities at the formation level, including a global presence, persistent presence in the Indo-Pacific. Depth is about magazine depth. It's our ability to endure through conflict, particularly through people and stockpiles. And edge are those things that contribute most to warfighting competitiveness. So for us, AUKUS Pillar 2 is predominantly about edge, because it's the, it's the cutting edge joint cross-domain technologies, and it's about breadth, probably best represented by the multi-domain task force um, that, uh, that Simon and I have been invited to contribute to, and we will. So those are the things that we're wrestling with. How do we balance those four values? Um, and I'm happy to unpack them further in questions, but I'll stop there. Uh, terrific. Thank you. Uh, I was really struck uh, by your comment uh, about what uh, Ukrainian blood has purchased for everyone else, which is time. Yeah. Uh, and so the question obviously becomes uh, time to do what and acquire what and set ourselves up for what. We'll pull on that a little bit, too. Um, General George. 
Uh, this past week, you've been uh, hosting uh, two of our closest allies. Um, I'm really curious uh, if you might kick us off uh, with your thoughts about how the U.S. Army mm -hmm. is thinking about collaborating with two of its closest allies in order to drive some of this future collaboration uh, that we just heard described. Sure. Um, and first, it's great to be up here with my teammates. We've had a, a really good couple of days yeah. of, uh, of conversation. So um, I, I could repeat a lot of the things I think that uh, Simon and, and Patrick both say, said about the environment. And um, just when I'm out talking to our commanders, I mean, for uh, 36 years in the Army, I don't think I've seen the change that I've seen, you know, that's happening in our world over the last, just the last couple of years. Um, and uh, we always say that the world is complex. We've been saying that, I think, forever. And I think the difference is, as uh, Patrick suggested, is it's also very volatile. I mean, any regional, I don't think anything now is regional anymore. It could be a spark um, that could set things off. So a lot of the discussions that we've been having are a big focus area uh, for us inside the Army, and that's how we transform and how do we, how do we change. And, um, I have four, we have four big focus areas in the Army war fighting to make sure that we're always focused on um, building lethality and building cohesive teams, and we want our formation to know that up and down. Um, delivering ready combat formations are important for the Army because um, and we, if for the U.S. Army, we're a global Army. Um, we just, just this last weekend, um, we sent uh, 7th Transportation Brigade over to the Middle East to help, you know, set up the port. Um, there in Gaza, so we got to be able to ready to do anything. And Army is a big part um, for us, for Army Material Command and everything we do for the organ, you know, organic industrial base. Um, Patrick mentioned um, magazine depth, and that's critically important. You know, we had a lot of discussions um, on that. I think the big thing that we all, all three of us realize is that, uh, you know, the old model of where you would, you know, put something out and say you had to change and maybe look at a system coming online in three, four, or five years, I think that we, you know, that we have to be quicker than that. And so um, what we talk about in the U.S. Army is, is continuous transformation. And what we're, we're seeing all the lessons that we're learning uh, from the Ukraine or the Middle East um, you really can't hide anymore. Um, you know, with all the sensors that you have out there, the UAS that's out there, um, everybody in here is in a, probably a million cell phone photos. I mean, there's really no hiding, you know, that's out there right now. And that has, and that has implications for what we're, um, you know, how we're going to have to transform. Commer commercial tech is moving much quicker than military tech in a lot of areas. And so we had a lot of, you know, conversations about that. I think people are moving to cities, combat's moving to cities. And, you know, that will have implications on what your force, what your capabilities are and, and, and how you're gonna, and how you're gonna do those things. So we've really been fo focused on that. And um, it's a lesson observed, I think, until you actually make changes inside your service to whatever you're doing with changing how you operate and this is what we're talking about we have to change how we operate on the battlefield um, we know that um, for example you're you can't have these big c2 nodes uh, command and control nodes that we've had you're going to have to be dispersed small very low signature that's out there or you're going to get killed on the battlefield um, and we have to transform how that looks um, we are going to, we talked a lot about um, unmanned systems and what we can do to partner in that area. Um, and um, that is, that's also tech that is moving really fast and we have to figure that out. Same with countering unmanned systems or counter UAS. Um, and I think we've also seen just what missile technology, and I think this gets to the cost effective, what we can do um, with PRISM, for example, one of our systems. Um, that can, you know, how far that can reach. It's very, very difficult to target land-based fires. And I think we've seen that um, over um, in Ukraine. It's, they can hide, they can move, um, and they're, they're very effective in, in just what that will do to contribute um, to the joint force. So um, we're, we're busy in the Army, but um, we have to continuously transform and, and uh, 
what we're doing is undertaking is using every advantage that we have together um, as AUKUS nations to use exercises for us to transform. We were just out at Project Convergence, um, all three of us working together and, and making advancements. Um, and, you know, what we're calling it in the U.S. Army is transforming in contact. We're going to have to transform in Europe. We're going to have to transform um, formations that are in the Middle East, and we're going to have to transform units that are out in the Pacific. And so we just have to have that culture, that innovation mindset. And we spent a lot of time talking about what we can do together um, to get momentum in those, those areas. Terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, if I can go back uh, now to uh, all of you, really. It's something that all of you have uh, touched upon. General George just gave us an example uh, that it's very hard to find distributed land forces. Uh, and so one of the things that I'd really like uh, to draw out on this conversation is how do you think about, how should we think about how land power contributes both to a combined fight joint fight in a theater that is predominantly water-based. Uh, General George, would you start us off on that? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think uh, I, you're not going to win uh, a war you know, from the sea. I don't think you're going to win a war from the air. I'm certainly not saying that you would just from the land. I mean, I think that there's no such thing as a, you know, a maritime theater, for example, I think these are joint theaters and it's going to take everybody's capability to do that. We certainly appreciate um, and we absolutely, you know, it's going to have to be a joint team and the, the Navy for the global commons. Um, but what I think you just said it, what you can do with long range fires and, you know, distributed forces that are out there. Um, in whatever environment, whether it's the Pacific or anywhere else, I think is going to be is going to be the difference. Um, same with the, in the uh, it's going to come down to I think it typically does to a close fight in the streets um, to you know people are living and I think Patrick or Simon said that people are living in the in the on the land um, command and control nodes are on the land and. Um, in cities, and so um, I think it's it's going to be the whole joint team that's that's going to have to be successful out there. Um, would you like to add to that at all? I mean, I'm trying to think too about this, about more capabilities, more attributes that we're looking for, particularly that we've learned over the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, this is a question that I got uh, from several folks incoming that uh, all three of you have talked about transformation, but we've had transformation shoved in our face with not one, but two wars that we're watching play out now. Uh, things that we didn't think were possible, uh, for instance, the Ukrainians who have no Navy sinking and destroying the Russian Navy Perfect. are transforming how we think about uh, not only war, but about power and the capabilities that we need to acquire. So uh, General Sanders, if, if I can ask you about this, can I ask you to pull a little bit about both innovation and technology that we've seen flowing out of Ukraine and the conflicts in the Middle East? Uh, particularly, you know, one example of this is kind of increased ways, as you were talking about, our phones, but how it is that we detect and target forces. How does that apply to a much larger theater uh, across a maritime realm, but that will come in the form of land power? So Ukraine points to uh, a combination of regression and progression. A lot of the lessons that you see come out of Ukraine remind us about what Sun was saying about this simply being the nature of war. You know, we are, you could see the same things, scenes that could have been at Antietam, could have been from the First World War. You know, it, those are playing out right in front of our eyes. Um, and those facets of war I don't think will change. Um, but we're also seeing, as you're hinting at, extraordinary progressive an almost revolutionary change in some of the character of war. And the, perhaps the most uh, revolutionary aspect to this is what you could almost describe as a Cambrian explosion of autonomous systems. Um, now, not all of them are working effectively, so up to 80% of the drones during one period recently simply were not getting through because of an extraordinarily contested electromagnetic spectrum and effective Russian use of electronic warfare. But I think this does point to a very, very significant change. And, and that, of course, is enabled by, by data and by, able, by, by being able to freely flow 
uh, data from sensors through to deciders, through to effectors, um, and across all domains. And uh, just last week um, in, uh, in Camp Pendleton, you saw a perfect example of that, where we were able to take data from an Air Force sensor, which we previously wouldn't have been able to do, not least because of levels of classification, um, and exchange it and, and pass it through a decider and then to an effector, both a British defector and an Australian effector. And the Australian effector was actually located in Australia. And that was done in, at machine speeds. Um, so you can see how the range, and you combine that with, with the sort of rate, you know, precision and the ability to use ubiquitous sensors, um, and the ranges and the precision that we can achieve with multi-domain effectors. So a land-based missile, PRISM, being fired out of a 30,000 not, not 100 million, $30,000 platform, which is hard to find, can reach out to unthink previously unthinkable distances and target a maritime platform. So that gives you a sense of how I think the innovation that we're seeing feeding, you know, being, being developed in, in places like Ukraine um, is, uh, it has got direct transfer and applicability into the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I really like these concrete examples uh, that you've offered up for us, uh, that we can see uh, bespoke capabilities in the EW uh, domain, in the fires, and in the data sharing and transfer that we have. Uh, is there a relative kind of uh, pecking order uh, for which uh, types of capabilities we want to go after first, or is it all of the above? How do you think about this in Canberra? Well, I don't think we can afford, nor do we have the time, uh, to be, um, as, as Patrick said, operating in series rather than, than parallel. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we are certainly starting from, I think it was the 26th President of the United States that said, do what you can with what you have where you are. And that's a good starting point because we can actually do quite a lot more with what exists already today. But I do think it's fair to say, and, and a lot of our conversations um, over the the last sort of couple of days have come back to our ability to share data at machine speed. So, you know, how, how do we communicate and share data? Because to actually deliver on the theory of any and every sensor, any decider and the best effector, and then the optimal sustainer, you need to be able to operate at machine speed and, and you need to get the right data in the right place at the right classification. So th that, you know, if we were to, to look at um, what some of the central priorities are, I think you know, what we would previously have called the network is really at the heart of, the, of digital age warfare in all domains, um, but particularly in the land domain. Uh, then I'd, I'd say, uh, and, and both uh, Randy and Patrick have, have mentioned this, long-range precision fires. Now, a, a, a little bit like littoral manoeuvre, when you say long-range precision fires, everyone thinks of a missile. That's the, that's the penultimate step in that kill web. Um, so it's ensuring that uh, when you strike, you can also shield. So what does our own protection look like in terms of integrated air and missile defence? But the game changer from a, a land domain contribution to that combined multi-domain uh, force is the ability to apply uh, fires at strategic and operationally relevant ranges. Uh, and, and that, I think, um, as an addition to that um, joint force is, is particularly powerful. So I'd say that th those two things, I, I think, are probably central um, to, the, to the value proposition of land power. Um, but the other things we've been talking about, you know, the ability to sustain contested logistics, um, the ability to apply autonomy, uh, resilient autonomy at scale, both on the ground uh, and in the air to achieve human machine teaming that give us uh, scaling and mass advantages, um, but also um, because our people are our most valuable asset, how do we move them away from the, the point of contact? I do not want to be putting 
our soldiers into a fair fight. I do not want to be trading blood in the encounter battle uh, if we can put machines uh, out front to do that. Yeah, but it's more than machines, right? Because we said oh, we don't want uh, a fair fight. We want a uh, manifestly unfair fight that tilts in our favor. Yeah. And so the question is, and I think you've underscored this really well, uh, is how does AUKUS, how do these three nations working together uh, become more than the sum of its parts? Uh, I think you've given us really interesting examples about how this becomes additive, uh, right? What uh, the UK learns all of a sudden is pushed out to US operators. What Australia can see all of a sudden gets integrated into a larger system here. I'm not sure, uh, General Sanders, if this aligns with the first of uh, the pillars that you were talking about, about height, that we stack on top of each other and we have more breadth than we might otherwise here. But I do really want to drill down, if I might, uh, for the challenges uh, that we're facing. Uh, I won't get into the one of the Washington games we play here, which is at what date precisely are we most concerned. It doesn't matter because we are concerned. I think that's the point that we underscore. Uh, but when we look about the decade of challenge, uh, critical challenge that we find ourselves facing and emanating from Beijing as they go through a rapid uh, military modernization, I guess the question that I have here is, how do we feel, uh, not we, how do all of you feel about the speed with which you see AUKUS coming online and bringing combat capability uh, to bear? Uh, is it delivering deterrence fast enough, given the scope of the challenge that we're facing? And what can we do to help accelerate this further? All three of you talked about timing and speed and the timeline that we face the challenge. General George. Yeah. Um, I, I know I would say we we want to go faster. Yeah. That would be my you know, would be my answer, um, and um, and we have given very specific examples. To give another example, you know, I think a lot of this with this partnership is that we get the ingenuity from three great countries and you know all that industry together. Um, you know, coming forward as a specific example, we were talking about um, UAS unmanned systems that we would we could have a, a common controller and we could exchange systems and do things. So I think that there's ways that we're figuring that out. Specific to where I'm at, you know, and one of the things that I think we need to do better is consolidate some of our funding lines. This is something we're going to have to do inside the Army, but also, you know, with a little bit of help. Um, and I've talked to folks on the Hill about this, is that I think we need to be a little bit more flexible with our, with how we buy things so we can, you know, do things very quickly. The, the, what the unmanned systems, what's happening in the electronic warfare EMS is changing every three weeks or three months and have the ability um, to update systems, to update software and to do things more rapidly. I think we need to be able to move from research and development to procurement you know, very rapidly. And that's been very hard for us to do right now, for example, with a continuing resolution as far as moving things around. Um, so I, I think that we have to speed our buying models a little bit um, to get after that. Uh, General Sanders, how are we doing on a timeline here? So I think it's probably, I mean, if you take a, an optimistic spin to begin with, you know, pillar one is not going to deliver for decades. You know, this is a very, very long time frame. The, f the full suite of Pillar 1 won't deliver for decades. We know that's supposed to start showing up in two years, though, in Australia. But Pillar 2, you will deliver, I mean, from a, the land contribution, the land opportunities that we can exploit yeah. in Pillar 2, you can be delivering next year. So when it, when it comes to pace, this is the yeah. best opportunity you have to inject pace into AUKUS and critically to, to begin to restore that commitment to deterrence mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that, that we've been talking about. When I... If I pick up on, so I don't want to describe all of the impediments because we face you know, all kinds, we face many. Um, but I, I think the one I would pick up on most is the ability to share data. It, it's the single most important enabler to allow us to uh, co-develop, you know, co-produce and co-sustain the sort of capabilities that we're, that we're talking about. Because if you can free the data around, um, uh, and then also uh, do it in a way that allows you in a more limited way to bring in other partners as well, um, then, uh, then that's where the pace will come from. Um, these inhibitors uh, to our collaborating uh, more closely than they have. Uh, 
General Sanders uh, described this as the need for all of our countries to assume more risk than we have before. That's true at every level. But if we assume more risk here, um, we get more things more quickly. Again, I, kn I know I've asked this uh, before, but I'm keying off something uh, that General Sanders just said uh, about AUKUS Pillar 2 has the ability, comma, potentially to start delivering immediately. I think you said last year. Um, there's a range of things that constitute Pillar 2. Uh, it's both broad and somewhat hard to hang your hat on. So I guess I would ask if we want to start delivering deterrence effects immediately, uh, is do you agree with this that it's uh, data sharing as priority number one? What should we be acquiring now or in the next 12 months that kind of add to the deterrence equation that we don't have right now? Sure, if, if I can answer it in two parts and just Certainly. kind of go back to your original question. At, at the outside, I, you know, I said in an era of great power competition, um, defence and security are a whole of nation endeavour, yeah. whole of government endeavour. And so it's going to require us to change our systems and processes. And I certainly know that in Canberra, uh, colleagues uh, across government um, and indeed across industry are are working on, on their part of the equation. For me, I have an obligation to make sure that we're good stewards of taxpayers' money, uh, but also to change what we can within our army. And so instead of um, starting the process of delivering a capability with the platform, let's take watercraft, for example, that's the last thing that I'll be able to deliver to our soldiers. They're already training. We've already written the concepts. We're already working with our joint partners and indeed our combined partners with the Marine Rotational Force in Darwin, the Composite Watercraft Company out of USAPAC for the last three years to demonstrate operational manoeuvre across the north of Australia. Um, you know, we're we're reskilling our people. The first seven um, um, uh, skippers of those uh, first watercraft are, are working, are being trained by our Navy today uh, in, in that partnership. So um, th that capability, and, we, and we're using, you know, civilian lease hire, you know, watercraft to, to, to emulate and simulate and provide some capability. So the last thing we'll deliver will be the major platform, which is completely the opposite of how we've previously done things, where that's the, you start with that and then you develop the capability. So it's going to be a team effort, um, but we have uh, responsibilities and we take them seriously and we're, we're moving out. Um, to the second part of, of the question, um, you know, I, again, I think all of our discussions have come back to our ability to share data um, and to be able to do that at machine speed. Um, when you talk of inhibitors, obviously there are different systems. There are different caveats on information in terms of security and, and access. Uh, and then there are different data standards. So I think right there you've got three key um, aspects and, and they're all things that we are getting after. And, and um, I know that uh, from an AUKUS perspective, you know, the, the, the theory of course is that if we can share the secrets associated with nuclear powered submarines, then everything else ought to be a little easier for us. Um, I'd like to go to the um, uh, audience, but I'm just going to underscore uh, something that uh, 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 someone had said to me uh, recently about what is AUKUS. I mean, we were kind of kicking this idea around. They said, well, it strikes me that it's at least two parts. It's the very visible things that you see, like this, right? It's the signal that we send of enhanced collaboration, the additive portions about this, what this means for all three countries. But it's also the less visible parts, uh, that uh, not only the end part, uh, the collaboration, but what new asymmetric edge capabilities are we not only thinking about collaborating on, but bringing to the field quicker than we might otherwise have the ability to, uh, both the invisible and the visible parts that actually feed into that deterrence equation. Let me turn to the audience here, uh, see what questions you have. I'd like to ask our audience, uh, both online, uh, but really for those of you in the room, to please uh, identify yourself and also keep your question concise. Thank you. Hands up. Uh, Dimitri, please wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dimitri with the Financial Times. 
Charlie, this is going to seem like uh, you read my mind, but we did not coordinate. In the context of a, a Taiwan contingency, if you had a magic wand for a day, what are some things that you're not thinking about right now in the armies that you should be thinking about? And are you facing any resistance from other services or parts of the joint force when you try to propose things that are not on the table at the moment? General George, do you want to start with that question? Um, I, will, I will answer your second part first, Dimitri. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm getting any you know, pushback from anybody in the, across from my, from my joint teammates. I really haven't, have not seen that. Um, we're um, exercising together out in the, in the Pacific. I mean, we've, we're doing war games together. Um, I'm uh, good friends with all the other chiefs, and when we talk about this, I think that there is a clear recognition that it's going to take everybody across the joint force with whatever we're doing um, to be successful out there. So I haven't, uh, and if I'm uh, if I'm forgetting to think about something, you know, I forgot what it is. I don't. We spend a lot of time actually trying to pour over this. I think if anything, what we're learning is that we're. Uh, you know, again, we have to figure out um, where I think our challenge is, is that we may observe something, it's actually drilling it into our formation and actually making the change. It's one thing to talk about a lesson that maybe you've seen from Ukraine, but if you don't actually change, you know, what you're buying, how you're buying things, if you don't actually change how you're operating and how you're training and how you're training your people, um, then, then you're not you're not really preparing your formation. And so that's, I think that's our big, you know, that's certainly my big focus. Can I just shift that question a little bit? Uh, General Sanders, when you think about this, I mean, all the lessons that we're pulling out of Ukraine, transformation of war, um, also landlocked country. Uh, does this apply when we're thinking about, you know, contested logistics, when we're thinking about a maritime theater, when we're thinking about a Taiwan contingency, which things should we have front of mind for this? Um, so first of all, and I should clearly say to the Financial Times that any decision to be involved in a, uh, in a conflict in the Indo-Pacific will be a government one, so I'm not going to put that out there. But, but, but um, So one of the things I think we have learned from Ukraine, and, and I don't know if this extends to the scenario you describe, is that at the start of a conflict, you see actually a dislocation of domains. Um, so, you know, mines and land-based coastal artillery, if you like, uh, pushes maritime forces away from the land. Um, you know, I'm not sure that you, you can draw all the right lessons from Ukraine, but certainly, um, you know, the air domain has not played a significant role, and ground-based air defense has kept the Russian air force, uh, for the most part, at, at range. And so you need to be able to think through um, how initially you can either unlock that problem or you, are, you have got sufficient organic resilience and capability to be able to cope with that initial phase of dislocation of domains because you may not be able to rely on the assumptions. But, but in the same way that you know, you, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. The only way that we unlock some of these very, very complex operational challenges that we're going to face is to do it, A, by integrating all the domains. I mean, I think that is our superpower as, as, as armed forces. We do it arguably better than anyone else in the world. And secondly, to be able to do it with partners. Um, and, and that comes down to what we've been banging on about, which is you know, enabling the data sharing and the, op and the interoperability. Um, uh, final uh, kind of ping off of Dimitri's question, noting that I'm changing the question as we go here. Uh, General Stewart, well, you've mentioned several times about the transformation towards, uh, from a land base towards a littoral force for the Army. Uh, why the logic of that change? How does this uh, apply to this specific region that we're talking about? How does it make the Army more useful? Sure. Um, can I just directly answer the first part? Of your or you can answer his question. That, that also works. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. But just just to say that, uh, in the same way as our uh, the, the work we're doing with allies and a growing number of partners has increased exponentially in just the last few years, 
uh, the same applies internally, so with the other service and domain chiefs in the Australian context. Um, we're, we're all rowing in the same direction. There's, I think, better cooperation and, and genuine teamwork than there's, there's ever been. So, and, and I think there's our circumstances demand n nothing less, and, and that's certainly a, you know, the approach that you would expect from military professionals. Um, to, to the point about why littoral manoeuvre, uh, well, it's physics and it's geography, um, and it is a response to how can we best optimise our army, our land forces, to do their principal job, which is to, to, to win the, the battle on the land, but in, how can we be more useful? How do you um, leverage the versatility of land forces in ways that better support the multi-domain and the combined fight? So if you, if you look at, as, as you've, you've mentioned, you know, the map, there's a, there's a lot of blue, um, but, but that blue extends inland as well. So how do, how do we best take advantage of a much greater surface area, if you like, by leveraging um, the littoral, the land, the sea, the air above, in, and, and the EMS um, for positional advantage um, so that we can apply effects from whichever domain is best placed to take advantage of the, the window of convergence to apply an effect. Um, let me see, uh, go out to uh, the audience for uh, questions. Sir, uh, please wait for the microphone. It's coming right your way. Hi, I'm going to stand up here. Hi, uh, my name is Nishank. I'm with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Lovely to meet you all. Uh, we've talked about asymmetric capabilities and the gray zone. So my question to each of you is, it, what is your conception of the gray zone in the Indo-Pacific vis-a-vis uh, China? And what is the role of land power, particularly in exploiting that gray zone? I'm wondering if you could draw on any lessons from Afghanistan and Iraq, knowing, of course, that that's, you know, we don't really talk about that much anymore. We're looking at Ukraine specifically. But certainly China and other actors are looking at the performance and, of course, the end state in both Afghanistan and Iraq. So what, if any, are some of the lessons that can be drawn on from those conflicts to uh, develop our understanding of the gray zone and perhaps how it can be exploited in the Indus in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the really simple question. How do you define uh, the gray zone challenge and what are we doing to go after it? Let's start actually right in the region. How do you think about this? Yeah, sure. Look, I actually don't subscribe to the theory of a gray zone, uh, other than to say that it, uh, I, I think the term emerges uh, from the, the, the gaps in our capabilities to respond to the challenges of the, of the 21st century. Um, and that's what we've been uh, working um, for, you know, the last sort of half decade in the sort of post-Iraq-Afghanistan uh, era uh, to understand and to understand how we need to firstly modernise, then it was transform and now adapt. And adapt means a continual process to the changes in our operating environment. So I, I, I think grey zone sort of um, really um, is, is a term that describes um, a set of challenges that we didn't really have good answers for. Um, and so the, the areas that we've just been talking about, those areas of endeavour, and in particular um, being able to share data and information at machine speed and in, a, in an environment uh, of trust is, is central to that. Um, to the question of, you know, what are some of the lessons that we've learned in places like Afghanistan that we need to bring with us into the future, um, I, I think um, the integration of effects, uh, but we need to do that exponentially quicker uh, and at scale, um, but, but also um, the relationship between special operations and conventional uh, operations, I think, needs to be a lot tighter. Um, and, for example, we've just completely transformed our special operations capability along functional lines, special warfare, strategic reconnaissance, technical uh, uh, enablement, um, and, and, and those kinds of, of functions. 
to best meet the demands of the, you know, of the theatre uh, and of the support for that combined and, and um, multi-domain fight. See if uh, we can gather maybe one or two more questions. Can Let I me, uh, I oh, sorry, one, yes. One quick comment. Of course, Colonel George. Um, that I was gonna add on the, for, that we are working on for us, and it's, um, and I agree with Simon as far as understand the environment. So we are actually, one of the things that we talked about over the last couple of days is we have a multi-domain task force is actually doing that together. Um, so again, part of this, we're looking at having a joint um, team. It'll be out at the third multi-domain task force. And again, I think that that's what's important is understanding your environment. Um, and that's what that organization is out there is built to do. I'm gonna go out, but Okay, uh, let me gather actually two questions at the time. That means you get to pick which uh, question you actually wanna answer. Uh, but let me go, uh, sir, right here, and then we'll go to the back, please. Sorry, right up here, thank you. Thanks, hi, Philip Rieker with uh, the Albright Stonebridge Group of Denton's Global Advisors. Uh, generals, thank you all. Uh, we have a team sort of uh, activated to, to try to help clients, companies uh, to to meet the needs and, and the opportunities of AUKUS. Just very briefly, I'd toss out there, what would your messages be um, to the private sector uh, that, that they should be doing, thinking about, and, and uh, how they might be focusing to, uh, to meet the, some of the needs you've described and, and help our militaries in, in that sense? Thank you, and then uh, there's a question right here. Uh, go ahead, the microphone's coming your way. Hi, um, Kate Kiddell from the Washington Post. Um, I just wanted to ask about your perceptions of Beijing's land forces, how they're changing, and whether you think Ukraine has really impacted their thinking um, in terms of how they're thinking regionally as well, you know, growing their partnerships in the region. Great. Uh, let me throw it back uh, to the three of you. We have one question about how uh, you'd like uh, the private sector to be thinking about some of the opportunities uh, that we've scoped here. And then two, uh, how is Beijing uh, viewing this, particularly some of the transformations that we've been talking about uh, here? General George, you mind kicking off? Yeah, well, um, so the big things that, that we've been talking about is uh, uh, unmanned systems and countering unmanned systems against the big challenges that we're seeing and how fast that that's spinning um, and how quickly that, that we need to be able to um, react to that. Um, we talk a lot about the network and what we need to do to simplify um, our network and a lot of that is, is the kind of commercial off the shelf um, tech that I think is out there and that's an example of something that is, that is moving very rapidly. Um, I think a lot in the contested logistics that we can, you know, that we're talking about additive manufacturing, um, telemaintenance and all the things again um, that we're learning, and then obviously spend a lot of time on long-range fires. So those are kind of the big areas that we are really focused on. I think we could um, bring things very quickly to AUKUS. So in the spirit of rugby, I'm gonna leave the hospital pass on the Chinese army to my good friend Simon uh, to, pick up, to pick up on. Um, and just to acknowledge Philip, who was not only a great servant of the United States, but a great friend of the UK as well. So it's good to see you again. Um, I think I would, I would focus on responsibility. Um, and what I mean by that is we know that some of the most important foundational technologies we're going to be employing over the next few decades are in cyber and particularly disinformation and misinformation and on artificial intelligence. And because we are world leading as nations in these spheres, and we are, um, the standards that we set, the approach that we take, will kind of set the standard for the rest of the world as well. So responsible use of artificial intelligence and the ethical considerations would be top of my, well, near the top of my list. So you've, uh, it's been punted over to you. Uh, <laughs> think about uh, the lessons that others might be drawing out of contemporary conflict, which may or may not be the same as the ones that we're drawing. Um, look, let me answer your question by saying a few things. The first is uh, deterrence. 
is ultimately decided in the mind of its objective. Uh, and our uh, nations uh, all uh, seek to ensure that we live in, in a world, uh, that we call it the rules-based order, that is, uh, there, there are road rules and that we, we can all, um, all nations can live um, in, in a way that satisfies their national interest, the way of life, their, their quality uh, of life, and uh, not be dictated to. Uh, and that's the world we've lived in you know, for about the last 80 years. That's worth preserving, um, and, and that's worth uh, working together to preserve. Um, as I said at the outset, whole of nation and a combined effort and capability or collective capability uh, is at the heart of supporting collective will. Uh, and it's our job as military professionals, as leaders of our respective armies, to ensure that we are doing our part to generate collective capability as part of that combined multi-domain force to provide the governments and the communities that we serve with options to demonstrate collective capability that, um, that um, uh, gives effect, gives expression to collective will. Um, it is not specifically directed at anyone. It is directed at everyone who might uh, seek to challenge um, that global rules-based order. I'd like to uh, wrap here uh, by thanking all three of you uh, for coming here to have this conversation because this is, uh, I'd say an underappreciated, but it's really an underdeveloped part of how we think about uh, this domain. Uh, this is a conversation about not only this partnership, but about how these nations work together to generate, as you just said, collective capacity, collective capabilities. And one thing that really struck me in our conversation is uh, if it hasn't hit you in the face already, the fact that we're moving into a new and much more contested environment, uh, it's very clear that the risks that we are assuming are greater. And so the risks that we need to take from how we do business as usual uh, to potentially what our budgets look like to the amount of friction we're willing to stand as we push back against coercive attempts to undermine this rules-based order is growing. So I'd like to thank you very much for coming out for this very public conversation uh, that is the start uh, of a conversation about where we go next. Thank you all very much. Thank you.